Hello everyone, I'm Paul Wright. I teach at Cabrini University in Radnor, Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia. Um, I'm delighted to be an affiliated faculty member of the Bren Mawr Film Institute. And as some of you know, um, BMFI during the COVID crisis, right, can't um, resume normal operations just yet, but they have been offering a series of online film discussions, some of which I've been a part of. And so uh, today I'm doing a bit of an introduction for you to the 1957 uh, Stanley Kubrick film classic, Paths of Glory. Um, we're going to have an online discussion of this on Monday, June 29th at 6.30 p.m. And I encourage all of you to go to the Bren Mawr Film Institute website in order to learn more about that and join us. Um, there's a lot I could say about this film. There's so much I want to say and probably will say when we have the discussion. Um, but I want to give you a kind of brief introduction to the film and hit some highlights of things that you may or may not know about this um, important Kubrick film. Um, it is arguably um, one of the greatest war films ever made, arguably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, anti-war films ever made, one of the great films made about World War I, um, but it's so much more than that. This is fundamentally a film that is not just anti-war, it is also anti-bureaucracy, anti-institution. It's very suspicious of the organizations that organize us and often sacrifice us uh, to the goals of its chain of command or to the goals of the organization as an abstraction. Um, and so from this point of view, Paths of Glory is very consistent thematically with a lot of other Stanley Kubrick films, all of which start with a fundamental uh, kind of skepticism, let's say, if not misanthropy, at least skepticism about human nature. Uh, in one interview, Kubrick famously said he doesn't think that we are Rousseau's noble savages. Um, we are ignoble savages. We are brutal. We are harsh. We sacrifice one another needlessly. And it's not to say Kubrick has zero hope for humanity, but he is emphasizing in the very same interview where he said that, that we can't form institutions and trust them to serve us if we don't acknowledge firsthand the frailties of our nature, if we don't be frank and candid about our limitations and about our ego and how even institutions have egos. And this story of Paths of Glory is um, a case in point. It is based on an original uh, 1935 novel by Humphrey Cobb that Kubrick read when he was about 14 or so, and it made such an impression on him that he bought the rights to the film, uh, sorry, to the novel to make the film, and um, really set out as a goal to recreate the feeling he had of reading that novel for his audience, to have it make the impression on the audience that the novel made on him. And this novel is, is really important in its own right. Um, it was an anti-war novel at a time when those weren't particularly well received, although the Christian Science Monitor famously um, gave it an enthusiastic review that I'm gonna uh, read to you here. Um, this is found, by the way, if you're interested in a great book, Kubrick fans should want, the Encyclopedia of Stanley Kubrick. Um, and in the entry on the Paths of Glory novel, not the film, but the novel, um, Christian Science Monitor in 1935 said, um, the genius of this book is not in the slaughter and stink of the field of honor, so much as the rotten, ruthless system of militarism that robs men of their most primitive rights. Um, Later on in 1971, when a paperback edition of the novel came out, the editor um, remarked that compared to Eric Maria Remarque's All Quiet on the Western Front, another great novel of World War I adapted into a great film, uh, that compared to um, Paths of Glory, All Quiet on the Western Front seems merely sentimental. Uh, that Paths of Glory was somehow the more brutal, candid, and honest take uh, on the war. And this was what was said about the novel. Um, so you can understand why Kubrick would have been drawn to it. Um, combat, violence, institutional sacrifice of individual lives. These are themes Kubrick would return to throughout his entire career. There's not one film of Kubrick's that isn't marked by that, which is saying a lot because Kubrick's movies, if you know them, they're also very, very different in certain ways, right? 2001 A Space Odyssey, Barry Lyndon, Clockwork Orange, Full Metal Jacket, Eyes Wide Shut. On the surface, these seem like movies from totally different universes, but they keep returning to the themes you find here in Paths of Glory as well. 
um, the danger of bureaucracies and institutions. Now, um, a couple of other things about the film's genesis, um, not taking anything away from Kubrick's genius and directorial style and visual eye. Um, Peter Cowie famously remarked that Kubrick in this movie uses the camera unflinchingly like a weapon um, to expose the hypocrisies and the ironies of, of human participation in war. Um, but putting that aside for a moment, the writing uh, of this screenplay, which is just as important, right? Adapting someone else's novel is never as easy as it might seem. That's why you get Oscars as well for adapted screenplays, right? Not just original screenplays. Well, there were a trio of people working on turning um, Humphrey Cobb's novel into this film. One is, of course, Kubrick, um, and he was always very involved in the writing of every uh, film he did, um, with one or two exceptions. Um, his other partners here are really interesting. When you think about the three people involved, it, it gives you a kind of interesting pause. You have Kubrick on the one hand. You have Calder Willingham, who would go on later to be one of the co-writers of The Graduate. Um, Buck Henry often is remembered for that, but Willingham just as important um, and has this really kind of black humor, satiric sensibility. Um, so you marry that up with Kubrick's sensibility, uh, that kind of misanthropy I talked about earlier. And then as a third party, just to make it interesting, you throw in Jim Thompson. Uh, yes, for those who are fans, that Jim Thompson, one of the great writers of 20th century American um, hard-boiled crime novels. Um, Thompson Hall also did a bit of work in Hollywood, and he actually collaborated with Kubrick on The Killing, um, Kubrick's film Before Paths of Glory, uh, one of the great crime films ever made. Um, the writing credit for The Killing never went to Thompson. It really went to Kubrick, and that rubbed Thompson the wrong way, and many people think that was a disservice because he was just as important, if not more, than Kubrick in the writing of The Killing. And some say the same is true of uh, Paths of Glory. So while you have um, Kubrick, Willingham, uh, and Thompson listed in that order, many would say Thompson deserves to be up top, that his writing voice uh, really turned this screenplay into what it became and allowed Kubrick to translate it into the masterpiece that it is. Um, some historical uh, things to think about here. Um, the French casualties, this is just an example. Obviously, it's not only French casualties that matter here, but it's just an example from one nation. French casualties in World War I in the first five months of the war were 300,000. I want you to just think about that number, 300,000 uh, dead. Uh, then you had about 600,000 wounded, captured, missing in action. So close to a million lives impacted or thrown away in some form or another, within the first five months of the outset of that conflict. And it only gets worse. And it only gets worse when we start magnifying that by the number of nations involved. Um, within that framework, the story of Paths of Glory um, certainly is a World War I story, right? You have this brutal trench warfare of attrition, um, particularly on the Western Front, where neither side is able to gain much in the way of ground. After that initial six months or so of the conflict, I think about six miles change hands uh, on one of the fronts there. Um, it's extraordinary, the kind of pointless waste of life. And what the story of Paths of Glory does is take you into a moment where that stalemate is um, someone attempts to forcibly break it. So a general wants promotion and favor within the military high command of the French army. He's so desperate to impress his superiors that he orders a suicidal attack by French soldiers. Many die, many uh, falter or refuse to participate. And some of the men, almost randomly, get picked to be put on trial for mutiny and treason for refusing to fight. And it's more or less the case that the French military command wants to make an example of X number of men in order to scare the rest. Um, this on top of the fact that the French officer class had basically decided to fire on its own men for not fighting. So they were at risk from the enemy, at risk from their own side, and now at risk of trial and court-martial and execution. Um, it's a really um, sad tale. Um, we see the whole thing through the eyes of Colonel Dax, played by Kirk Douglas, who was a major producing force behind the film and would go on to work with Stanley Kubrick in things like Spartacus. 
Um, Douglas's character is not as large in the original novel as it ends up being in the movie. Um, I guess for obvious Hollywood big time movie star uh, reasons. Um, in any case, Douglas is our um, moral compass in the movie. He's also our um, window into the experiences of these combat soldiers, particularly those below the officer class, uh, the enlisted and conscripted men um, who end up doing all the suffering and dying for almost no reason at all. And this idea of the pointlessness of um, war and the pointlessness of bureaucracies um, uh, dominated by the egos and the vanities of their leaders, right? Um, that's one of the messages of the film. But it's a film as much about institutional uh, egoism, if that makes sense. It's not just individuals driven by ego and vanity, but sometimes institutional cultures are equally driven by those things. Um, to put it in a different way, um, if you think of David Simon's uh, amazing television series, The Wire, about the war on drugs in Baltimore, um, David Simon has acknowledged Kubrick's Paths of Glory as one of many influences on The Wire. And one thing uh, Simon has said uh, about The Wire in the past is, if you think it's just about Baltimore, you're really missing the point of the show. It's about um, modern American cities, maybe modern cities everywhere. And the same is true of Paths of Glory. It is not just a film about World War I or the French military. It's a film about how all organizations, but particularly military ones, um, often take on lives of their own, uh, psyches of their own, and sacrifice individual human beings' uh, careers, but in this case even their lives, to goals that ultimately make no sense other than perpetuating the institution and its uh, self-understanding, which is really perverse when you think about it. So much like The Wire, not being just about Baltimore or Paz of Glory is not just about uh, the French military. Tell that, however, to the French. So um, the response to this film in France was pretty predictable, right? It was not shown for almost 20 years in France. You couldn't see it in France until 1976. Why? Because the ruling political class, which was also France's ruling military class uh, during the resistance era of World War II, um, wanted no besmirching of French honor in the First World War and therefore rejected outright um, this film. So that's why you couldn't see it in France for a long time. Couldn't see it in Belgium either for similar reasons. You also couldn't see it in Spain, Switzerland, or Israel. And you might ask why. The reason is those countries had mutual censorship agreements with France during those years. So they basically agreed to uh, refuse paths of glory on their shores um, in exchange for other films being censored in France, for example. Um, so it took a long time for that culture of censorship to permit the film to be seen outside of the United States, or at least to be seen in countries that really needed to see it. Um, and I think it's sad because while there are things specific to the French military in World War I depicted in the film, for the most part, it's a film that is uh, timeless and ageless. It's a film that can be about any military hierarchy anywhere, and by illusion can be about any organization that dehumanizes and sacrifices the people that uh, serve it and sacrifice for it on a daily basis. Um, so I hope you'll approach this film um, with open eyes and realize that it's a film um, meant to speak to a larger human condition and not simply be a history lesson. So whatever you may or may not know or care to know about World War I, um, isn't the important thing at the end of the day. This is a film that is meant to make you question um, your obedience, your participation, and um, your relative interest in the organizations that you serve. And to ask of those organizations whether they really um, care about you and have your best interests at heart or are simply using you. And I think all of us at some point or another have felt that way about any number of institutions we've been a part of all the way from childhood in school up to uh, the institutions we work for that, are, that employ us. Um, so you don't have to have been in the military to appreciate this story. Um, I hope you'll enjoy the film. I hope you'll come to it with lots of questions on Monday the 29th. And there's lots more I want to share about it. Look forward to talking to you.